Yeah, all right. This interview is part of the Oral History Project sponsored by the State Bar of New Mexico and its Senior Lawyers Division. I am Terrence Revo, the chair of the Senior Lawyers Division of the State Bar. Today is June 28th, and I am interviewing Justice Jean Franchini in my office in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Before we get started, I would like to state for the record that I asked Justice Franchini how he wished to be addressed today, and he told me that he wished to be addressed as Gene. That's true. All right. So uh, with that in mind, Gene, would you tell us uh, what life was like in your family and in your community as you were growing up in Albuquerque? Well, I was born, Terry, here in Albuquerque in 1935. Both of my grandparents, both the Franchinis and the Bios, came here at the turn of the century, 1898 and 1899. Uh, Albuquerque was a small town then when I was born. I don't remember this personally, but my folks told me there were about 30,000 people, as opposed to about 5,000 when my grandparents got here. And uh, they stayed here and uh, brought some of their families uh, over, their brothers and sisters, and uh, we spent the rest of our lives uh, here in, in Albuquerque and in New Mexico. Uh, now, you grew up on, was it Fruit or Roma? No, it was on Marquette, uh, Marquette. 715 Marquette Northwest. Still there. Um, what uh, businesses or uh, professions were your parents in? My uh, father uh, worked first for the uh, Anchor Liquor Company, which was a wholesale liquor company. Uh, after the war, uh, in the Second World War, my father and nine other individuals uh, borrowed $10,000 apiece, a magnificent sum of $100,000, which was a lot of money in those days, and started the Southwest Distributing Company. And uh, he was the secretary treasurer of that company, so uh, he was in the wholesale liquor business. Uh, that Southwest Distributing Company also was a, was a uh, home office for Thunderhead Oil and Gas, which sold asphalt, and we also uh, distributed at the wholesale level uh, not only liquor, wine, and beer, but also foods uh, throughout the state of New Mexico and in southern Colorado. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how about the community around you when you were growing up, when you were a teenager? What was that like? It was in the 1950s, and it was an altogether a uh, different era. Uh, there were only actually four high schools in Albuquerque. There were Albuquerque High School, uh, there was Highland High that was brand new, and then we had St. Mary's, we had Manal and Albuquerque Indian School. So the community was very small and was very, very close. When we entered into athletic competition, it was uh, a war, just like all high school athletics should be, but other than that, it was a very friendly, very close atmosphere. And no matter what of those high schools you went to, even to this day, uh, I can count many, many friends who went to every one of those schools. And it was a very close relationship. Was there anything about your childhood or your adolescence that influenced your decision to become a lawyer? You know, Terry, I've got to tell you that I can't remember a time when I didn't want to be a lawyer or didn't know that I was going to be a lawyer. I, I don't know how that <laughs> happened. But it was, uh, it was just a fact in my life that that's what I was going to do. Was there anybody in your family or your extended family that were lawyers? No. Uh, there were uh, some Italian boys who, who had become uh, lawyers, and one of them, the, most, the one that was uh, most prominent, was Gino Matusi. Uh, Rolando Matusi, his cousin, was also uh, a lawyer. Uh, there was also Mr. Dick Civarolo, whose family came from Gallup, who was a lawyer. Um, but nobody in my direct family uh, uh, practiced law until I started. Were you the first one in your family to go to college? No, I wasn't the first one in my, well, my immediate family, yes. Uh, but in my extended family, uh, no. I had uh, uh, an uncle and uh, a couple of cousins who had also gone to college. Where did you go to college? From uh, St. Mary's High School here in Albuquerque, I got a scholarship to Loyola University in New Orleans, which is called Loyola of the South. And I went there two, for two years on a combined business and law 
program. I got to tell you this. I want to show you how smart I was. I spent two years there, and it finally dawned on me, and I finally came to the conclusion that was the only law school in the country who was still teaching the Napoleonic Code. <laughs> And so I decided that maybe I ought to go complete my first degree, which was in business, uh, with a major in accounting, and I came back to the University of New Mexico. And after I got my first degree here, I went on to uh, Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. For my, for my law degree. <laughs> now, Georgetown in Washington, D.C. Is a, is a ways away from Albuquerque. So Certainly is. How did you make that connection? You know, that connection was made uh, many years before, and the real connector, I think, for Georgetown and the uh, state of New Mexico was Dennis Chavez, Senator Dennis Chavez. He went there, and when he became United States Senator, particularly during the Depression years, he would recruit young men uh, to come to Georgetown. He would give them jobs as clerks. Uh, elevator operators, etc., in the United States Senate, and that's how it started. And then uh, Senator Montoya, who was then before a congressman, also uh, kept that up. And there just seemed to be a steady stream of New Mexico young men uh, at that time who were going to Georgetown, particularly to the law school. Oh, that's fascinating. That's uh, that's how it happened. When you went to law school in Georgetown, were mm -hmm. there any women in your class? Very few. Uh, as I recall, there were five women in my class. Four of them were nuns, and none of them graduated. <laughs> Why what a difference, that? huh? <laughs> Why was that? You know, uh, just a long-standing, I think, uh, prejudice in law schools, generally speaking, not only at Georgetown, uh, it's that uh, they looked at an old, old opinion of the Supreme Court of the United States that somehow said that the nature of women was such that they, uh, it was just indecent for them. I don't think that's the word that they used for them to engage in the banter and the give and take of, uh, of, of a courtroom. And in any event, uh, it was very, very difficult for uh, women in those days to uh, go ahead and uh, get through law school. Mm -hmm. Uh, were there any professors at the law school who functioned as role models for you or inspired you in the legal profession? Uh, there were very many, uh, but one in particular uh, that stood out in my mind was a man by the name of Kenneth Pye, P-Y-E. He was a professor of law who taught me uh, criminal law and procedure. He also taught me uh, some contracts. Uh, he was a man who um, had the tremendous ability to organize uh, subjects and particularly courses in a, in a fashion I've never quite seen before. And uh, he was a tremendous influence on me. He left Georgetown to become the dean of the Duke Law School and then became president of uh, SMU and passed away about three years ago uh, while he was in that position. Uh, that sounds like a fascinating guy. He was a fascinating guy. Uh, the most fascinating thing about it is that uh, when I had him in law school, he was a very thin, wiry uh, fella. When he passed away as president of SMU, I think he weighed over 325 pounds. I don't know why, but uh, he had that kind of a problem. <laughs> When you were going to law school, uh, did you know what kind of lawyer you wanted to be or what kind of practice you wanted to have? Uh, oh, I think I probably had some ideas, but as you know, as well as anybody, uh, what you decide or what you wind up doing uh, is decided for you by other people, namely your, your clients. <laughs> and so I was particularly interested in, uh, in the criminal law, and I was interested also in business law because my background uh, all the time I was growing up uh, was in business and, and accounting. Uh, and uh, so I was interested in those two fields uh, particularly. Um, were there any courses that you took while you were in law school that, that impacted you that said, you know, I really want to do this kind of work? Oh, I think every one of them did. I, I was, I was, I was interested in all of those uh, in all of those subjects. I was particularly interested in the criminal law courses. 
uh, and I was particularly interested in contracts and agency. Um, 90% of the law school curriculum, at least in those days, was really business-based. And when young people used to ask me afterwards, uh, what do you think I should major in before I go to law school, I would always tell them business. Because all of the terms that are used in, in all of those courses are business terms. And you're about uh, four years ahead of the game if you learn those and what the difference is between a corporation and a partnership and a limited partnership and what a bill of exchange is. And uh, it's, it's really important. So those, all of those subjects and all of those courses were of uh, particular interest to me. When you were in law school, were there any other people from Albuquerque or New Mexico who were there with you? Yes. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, Justice Richard Ransom and I were uh, started at the same time. Uh, he went straight through, so he graduated a little bit uh, before uh, I did. Uh, there were a couple of other young men from New Mexico who were not at Georgetown, but were in law school in Washington, D.C. Uh, there were um, Joe Duran. I don't know whether you remember him, Terry. He lives now in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, I understand. Uh, also with me were uh, Ted Montoya, who was a year or so behind me at Georgetown, uh, while his uh, brother was first a congressman and then a United States senator. So yeah, there were there were several of us. Uh, before I go into uh, questions regarding your legal career, Gene, uh, I want to talk a little bit uh, about your family and your life outside the law. Mm -hmm. So uh, when did you get married? I got married... Uh, when I was uh, 25 years old, right out of uh, uh, law school. Uh, that marriage uh, uh, didn't work out, and then I married uh, Glennie uh, Hatchell uh, uh, 28 years ago in, uh, in 1969, and uh, we've been married ever since. And she's still talking to you? She's still talking to me, and, and f she's still laughing at my jokes, which is really <laughs> something. And she's heard them 4,822 times if she's heard them once. Uh, well, maybe we ought to interview her at some point. Listen, that would be a lot better interview, I think. <laughs> um, and, uh, and your kids? We've got five children. We have four of them are, are still living. Uh, three of them live here uh, in Albuquerque, and the fourth one is a teacher, soon to be a principal in Washington State. Uh, now, one of your daughters is a lawyer, is she not? Yes, Nancy, the youngest. Okay. All the rest of them were successful. <laughs> <laughs> and did Nancy become a lawyer because you were an example or a mentor to her? You know, Terry, that's a good question, and I think so, and, and I kind of hope so. I was on the district bench, and there was a murder trial in Carlsbad, New Mexico. And um, the Supreme Court sent me down there to try the case because all of the judges in the 5th District at that time took a powder. This was a very big case and involved uh, the victim was a very, very famous man down in that area. And I was going to be down there for about 18 or 19 days and uh, Nancy was about three years old. And her mom and I, and uh, I was on the bench and her mom and my mother brought Nancy down with them to visit. And uh, when I came up on the bench, they say, all rise, you know, like they usually do. And Nancy from the back of the room says, it's just daddy. <laughs> and, her mother tells, and her mother tells me that later on that day, she says, I want to be a judge too. And uh, her mama said, well, you know, you have to go to law school first. And she says, okay, I'll do that. This is when she was three years old. And as a matter of fact, that's exactly what she did. <laughs> Is she practicing here in Albuquerque? Yeah, she's uh, at the uh, uh, law office of Casados and, uh, and Mann. She's a trial lawyer, and she's uh, on the defense side of the, of the case. Uh, does that it's bother bit, you at all? It doesn't bother me, but the people ask me all kinds of questions. Where did you go wrong, and how, what did you do to that young lady that she made her go to the other side of the fence? <laughs> did you know Ed Casados when you were young? Oh, he was very good friend of mine and I thought he was an excellent lawyer and I was so pleased when Nancy uh, uh, went with him because I knew he would be a great mentor and a great teacher for Nancy. 
Um, what kind of support has Glennie been for you during your career as a judge? I wouldn't be where I was if it wasn't for that uh, that woman. She's um, uh, she's been a tremendous influence. Uh, when I decided to run for the Supreme Court, uh, and I told her. Uh, she didn't talk to me for a while. <laughs> uh, after she got over the shock, she uh, she ran my campaign, and she's uh, she was really something. She really is. Well, I've known her for a long time, <laughs> as I've known you, and mm -hmm. she's a remarkable woman. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk a little bit about your your legal career. Uh, where did it start? Who did you work for? What kind of work did you do? I went uh, directly from law school after passing the bar uh, in with Rolando Matusi and Avelino Gutierrez. And we formed a uh, partnership called Matusi, Gutierrez, and Frankini. And that's where it all started. Our offices were in the Sims building. Uh, and then later on, when the Bank of New Mexico right across the street was built, uh, we moved into, in, into that building. Um, Things were such that because of a uh, serious illness uh, suffered by Mr. Rolando Matusi, um, I was shoved into the position where I tried, I think, probably f seven major jury trials in the first year of my practice. <laughs> Talk about and all seven of them went di directly to the Supreme Court of the state of New Mexico because they were going to test me as far as they were going to test uh, also the cases. We didn't have a court of appeals in those days. So in the first year, I was in uh, uh, major jury trials seven times. Uh, and then the first two years, I think I was in the Supreme Court of the state of New Mexico eight or nine times. Uh, and I don't think I was there that many times in the next 10 or 12 years. So <laughs> it was a pretty active practice very, very quickly right off of the bat. Well, given that trial by fire that you just described, mm -hmm. how do you think that molded your attitude towards the practice of law and other lawyers? Practicing law in New Mexico and particularly in Albuquerque at that time was a real pleasure. Uh, the bar was small, my number, uh, of, as, as far as admissions are concerned, is 851. And they tell me <laughs> that they took them in order in those days. And I got in August the 11th, 1960, and my number was 851. I don't think there were 3,000 lawyers in the whole state, maybe a little fewer than that. I think there were something like 300 in Albuquerque. And so not only... Uh, was it an experience trying cases against uh, against these older people? But these older men uh, would also be teachers and re would really help you actually during the trial, which doesn't happen anymore. And to watch them operate and to be in a trial with them uh, was not only a very uh, exciting experience, it was a great training experience. And uh, I don't think I'll ever forget it. So some of those people that you tried cases against mm -hmm. that you just referenced, who were they? Well, for one, and one who I think had a tremendous influence on me was, um, was uh, Lou Sutton. And I also tried cases against Jim Polanis. That was the old law firm of Iden and Johnson. Remember Judge Johnson? Yes. They had an influence on me also, a tremendous influence on me. I don't know whether you remember him, but in that same law firm was a trial lawyer who I thought was just an excellent trial lawyer named Richard Cooper, uh, tried case against Richard Civarolo, who was uh, an excellent trial lawyer, Bob Tykert, um, just to name a few. I'm going to, I'm going to miss some. Uh, but uh, every one of these men uh, uh, had an influence on me. You raise an interesting dichotomy or comparison that the lawyers that you were trying cases against when you were a young lawyer mm -hmm. actually tried to help you out oh, yeah. as opposed to what we see today mm -hmm. where there's actually very little of that. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think that was? I wish I knew the answer to it, Terry. I, I think uh, the biggest factor is that uh, the bar got bigger. Uh, and another factor I think that's present is that... Uh, 
the people that are going through law school today and for the last, say, 20 years or so, the emphasis has been, I think, different. Uh, the, the emphasis has been more on making a buck and making it a business rather than a profession. And I know that that line gets very, uh, very vague at times. But I think a combination of those two things has, um, has uh, influenced it. You know, you can't get to like each other or trust each other unless you know each other. And you can't know each other unless you spend time with one another. I'm thinking about the bar meetings. For example, the state bar meeting that's coming up. If they draw four to 500 people out of a bar association that has now almost 7,000 people, it's going to be a good turnout. Everybody went to the bar uh, when I was a young lawyer. Everybody went to the bar association meetings and everyone went to the, to the, to the state bar meeting no matter where it was held uh, because it was uh, fun and you got to sit and visit with, with friends and uh, it had a great influence on the way you practiced law and the way you trusted one another. Today everything has to be in writing. If I make you an offer or you send me a counter offer, everything has to be in writing. And if it's not in writing, something suspicious about that. I've got to tell you that I probably settled 500 cases over a cup of coffee or a drink uh, with any number of lawyers that I've mentioned. Um, and uh, it didn't necessitate anything other than a sh shaking of the hand. Sometimes we didn't even shake hands. We said, okay, <laughs> that was it. And, and I, you know, times change, and the circumstances change, but uh, I think those are some of the elements that stick out in my mind anyway. One of the things that occurs to me that I've heard about in Albuquerque mm -hmm. that I've not heard about in any other legal community is the concept of a street lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, you're familiar with that, I assume. Sure. Uh, tell us about that. Tell us what you observed and who the people were who were the street lawyers. I don't think that it's uh, any surprise that 80% of the practice of law uh, in any community, and particularly this was true of Albuquerque and Santa Fe, uh, were controlled by less than 10% uh, of the lawyers. Uh, you get the, the banks, uh, the insurance companies, and the public service companies the railroads, and those had a tendency to go to the larger law firms. Everybody else was competing for the 20% of the practice that was left. And the 20% of the practice that was left had to do with, with problems of the ordinary person on the street, uh, getting rear-ended by a bus, uh, having an automobile accident, uh, a contract uh, for the purchase of a, of a piece of property, a house. Uh, a vacant lot uh, that went haywire, went, went, went sour. Um, very little employment uh, law in those days uh, as, as, as compared to now. Uh, there wasn't a bunch of, uh, or a big uh, corporate practice. It was, uh, it was uh, very, very small. I, I must have formed in my legal career 100 or 150 small corporations. <laughs> um, my practice... Today, well, for example, today, most people specialize. I think I had one of the most general practices that uh, you could have, and, and it just happened that way. And thank God it happened that way. I think I would have gone nuts <laughs> if I would have had to do just one thing. Uh, but I practiced uh, trial law, and I tried all kinds of cases, not only personal injury cases, but uh, contract cases, uh, corporate cases, tried all kinds of cases. Um, practice in the field of probate, um, practice in, in the business law field from soup to nuts, and, and uh, uh, even did a little bankruptcy, I mean, if you can imagine, and, and never thought twice about it. I think four times about it now. Uh, it's, there, there's so much of it, and it's so much more complex now and so much bigger that to have a general practice like that is, is almost impossible. But that general practice and that taking those, fighting for that other 20%, making yourself available to try those cases, is what a street lawyer is all about. 
because those cases arose from the street. And that's why I think they call it that. Uh, who are some of the uh, top street lawyers that come to your mind that you knew during your career? Oh, gee, I mentioned a bunch of them already. Uh, um, Gene Cleekin. That's a great lawyer. Now, there's a guy who was uh, a plaintiff's lawyer primarily and then became a defense lawyer and then became a, a, a plaintiff and defense lawyer combination uh, uh, in, in, in his career. And he was a, he was a street lawyer. Um, all of these lawyers were, were, were street lawyers when they first started out. Dick Severolo was a street lawyer. Rolando Matusi was a street lawyer. Um, uh, Lou Sutton was a street lawyer. Uh, there was just a lot of, uh, uh, of cases uh, outside of the big bank so forth, uh, insurance kind of cases uh, that were uh, street lawyer cases. Most people all uh, were active in that practice. I remember when I came to town that there were a number of small offices right on 4th Street, mm -hmm. south of the courthouse. And it seems as though there was a lot of what I would call street lawyers mm -hmm. in that area. Yeah. Uh, ben Traub comes to my mind. Oh, yeah. Joe and Dick Traub. And, and Dick. Dick. Uh, and I found those people very interesting, and they were also willing to teach. Mm -hmm. That's uh, right. Particularly somebody like Ben Traub. Sure. Uh, and they had those uh, those small law offices. That was due also to the fact we had no office space in this town. There was the first National Bank building that was full, and there was the Sunshine building on the other side that was full. And it was... Uh, uh, it was the rest of this town downtown, which was primarily on 4th Street, was where a, a lot of those uh, business people were. Um, one of the ones that was a, a great street lawyer and probably the dean of, uh, of plaintiff's lawyers is Joe Smith. And his partner uh, for a long time was Lorenzo Chavez, Mayor Chavez's dad. Great street lawyers uh, uh, and great teachers uh, uh, that influenced a lot, a lot of people. How did your career evolve from those early days when you were trying all those cases that you referenced? Evolved? They just kept coming. Uh, I think one of the big things that probably uh, got me known more than anything else is when the... Uh, court uh, appointed me to represent Reyes Tijerina after the courthouse raid. Uh, that was a case that had national uh, publicity and was uh, um, all over the world, as a matter of fact. And uh, uh, he was, um, w when he was arrested, he turned himself in and, uh, of course, didn't have any money. And so the Supreme Court appointed me it was the district court with the okay of the Supreme Court to uh, represent Mr. Tierina, mainly, I think, because I could speak some Spanish. And uh, that was a case that uh, took about three months uh, to pick the jury and to try the case. And it was the only case in which uh, Mr. Tierina came out uh, not guilty on, uh, on, on the four counts. That's a story in itself. We could go on for three or four weeks about that case, but... Uh, can you give us a thumbnail sketch? Because everybody knows about that case. Well, when that thing first hit, and they had that courthouse raid up there uh, in, uh, in uh, Tierra Maria, uh, big political lawyers from all over the country were coming in here. One of them that I remember was Bill Kunstler from Chicago. They wanted to get into this, into this political case. And it really wasn't a political case. It arose out of the fact that Mr. Tiarina was an expert in the area of the uh, 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 land grants. And he was, uh, he was pretty knowledgeable about the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo uh, that gave tremendous, uh, gave, uh, gave legal position to those people who were heirs of land grants, both from the Spanish and from the uh, Indian and the Mexican. And the, uh, in, and the Indian land grants. And as a matter of fact, the, uh, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is in our Constitution of the state of New Mexico. It is one of our Bill of Rights, right up there to the top. So in any event, um, he formed this group, called it the Alianza. 
and uh, they were fighting for their rights as far as the land grants of New Mexico is concerned. They had a meeting up in Coyote, New Mexico, and uh, it was a meeting that the attorney, uh, district attorney for Santa Fe County uh, really was bothered by. And he went up there and made several arrests, uh, or sent the state police to make several arrests. Unlawful assembly, if you can imagine. This was in the, in the 1967-68 uh, time. And uh, they took these people to, that they arrested to Tierra Maria, to the jail there. And they were going to arraign them on a certain day. A lot of people showed up. Now, there were no checks coming into a courthouse. In Tierra Maria in those days, everybody was armed in the courthouse. Everybody. Uh, they didn't have any uh, clickers or anything that checked for weapons. In any event, um, an altercation happened in the lobby of the courthouse. Uh, Reyes Tijerina's daughter and her boyfriend <coughs> came in with a bodyguard and there was a state policeman making a phone call in the lobby of this courthouse. And I don't know what happened, but s somehow the policeman made a sudden move and the bodyguard shoots him in the leg and drops him. At the same time where all of these people are being herded into the courtroom uh, for an arraignment. And all hell breaks loose. And some people take the jailer and take the, uh, the uh, pros pros prospective defendants into the, into the council room for the county of uh, Rio Riba. And the rest of them, they move up into the clerk's office. Reyes Tijerina isn't there. So his daughter goes running out of the courthouse and says, Daddy, Daddy, they're killing our people. And here comes Reyes. <laughs> and he goes up into the clerk's office. And uh, to make a long story short, um, now they don't know what to do because they've got some people in the, in the, in the county uh, commissioner's office and they've got people in the clerk's office um, and the people are uh, there's gunfire all over the place nobody gets killed <laughs> which is a miracle and uh, Governor Cargo is out of uh, the state and he finds out about it and he activates the National Guard and here comes tanks uh, up to uh, the courthouse they, they circle the courthouse by this time Reyes Tijerinas is gone and he's uh, he's hiding out uh, in, in, in the hills. And so uh, they, they, make, uh, they take all of these people to a little uh, a town outside of Tierra Maria, uh, and they, uh, which, is, uh, which is called Canjilon, which means horn. And it was just a, it was just a mess. So in any event, um, there's a big manhunt. And Reyes Tierina turns himself in in, uh, in San Isidro, New Mexico, to the state police. And a trial ensues. There was a trial of him, and there were a trial, I think, of seven other individuals. And they were before Paul Larazolo uh, in, in the district court here. And uh, first started off of trying all of these defendants, 54 counts each. And Paul put up with that for about three weeks. We were in the process of trying to pick a jury for all of these people, some of whom, for example, Reyes Tierrina, was subject to the death penalty because one of the charges was capital kidnapping, which subsequently was thrown out uh, as being unconstitutional. But if you injured somebody to such an extent that they could die from their injuries while they were being kidnapped, that was capital kidnapping in New Mexico. You could get the death penalty for it. So... Uh, about halfway through the jury selection of, for all of these cases, Paul decides to sever the cases. And he tells the DAs, who were special DAs by that time because the DA from Santa Fe wouldn't handle the case, was Jack Love and, and, and a fellow by the name of Garcia up in uh, Blind Man in, in Santa Fe. And he says, go out, pick a, well, one defendant and, four, and three charges. So they go out and they come back in and we're waiting there and they say, we're going to try Reyes Tierrina. That was no surprise. 
and we're going to try him on capital kidnapping, on assault on a jail, and on a, a, on a, um, a battery of a police officer uh, that would cause that could cause death. That was a death penalty and two ten to fifties. Assault on a jail was an old. <laughs> was an old charge out of the uh, territorial days and that was submit, that was also taken over into the state. And so any event, uh, when that happened, I turned to Tierina and I said, uh, Reyes, those are the only three charges they've got that they can't prove. <laughs> they can prove the other 52, but those three they couldn't prove. And the way it worked out, they couldn't prove them, and, uh, and that's why you got acquitted on those oh. cases. What a story. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, it's, there's a lot to it, I'll tell you. How did you get to be a judge? There are, uh, it, it's not because I'm so brilliant, okay? Uh, what happened is, is that I happened to go to school at the same time with a fella who became governor of the state of New Mexico, Jerry Apodaca. And Jerry and I played football against one another. He and I, he played for the South and I played for the North in the All-Star High School football game. And uh, when Jerry became governor, one of his closest friends, and one of my closest friends, was Bob McBride. And he appointed Bob to uh, the district judgeship here in Albuquerque. And when that happened, there was a group of us who were really happy to see Bob, uh, Bob uh, go to the bench. Uh, but we advised Jerry at that time there may be a problem because Bob was a state senator, and he voted for a pay raise while a state senator. We've got a little quirk in our Constitution that says you can't take that job if you do that. If you create a job or you increase the emoluments thereof, you can't take that job. Uh, you have to be re resigned from the Senate for, or the House for a period of, uh, of a year before you can take that job. And um, they thought, oh, well, nobody will say anything about it. Well, they did. And they filed a lawsuit and went all the way up to the Supreme Court of the state of New Mexico and the Supreme Court says, you have to leave. It was a three to two decision. And so here we go again. And they say, you know, uh, we meet and they say, who's going to be the judge? And uh, they say, you are. And I said, no, <laughs> not me. I want no, you ought to do it. No, I don't want to do that. Hey, you can go fishing a lot more than you're being able to go fishing now. And that got my attention. And I said, well, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not too keen on this. And uh, uh, the governor called me and says, I want you to do this. And I said, Jerry, thanks a lot. I know you're your chosen people. Why don't you choose somebody else <laughs> once in a while? He says, I want you to do this. I said, okay. So I leave a job that I'm making real good money. <laughs> And I take this job, and I bring home my first paycheck, and I give it to Glenny. <laughs> and I said, and she says, where's the rest of it? And I said, that's it. And here's the, you take care of it. And so that's how I became a judge. <laughs> what year was that, Jim? 1975. <laughs> you know, you said something in your last answer that jogged my memory. I remember you telling me that you were a high school football coach. Mm. Yeah, and I was a high school football player, too. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so which high school did you play for? Uh, St. Mary's. St. Mary's. Yeah. All right. And so when were you the coach? Oh, way after I became a lawyer. Uh, I, was a, I was a coach at St. Mary's after uh, I had become a lawyer, and, uh, and I was helping Bay Perenni, who was my coach, um, coach a team that he had. That's a story in itself, too. You want to hear some of the members of that team? Uh, I was just going to ask you because I know who they are. John Brennan. Manny Aragon, Joe Allered, Judge Allered, uh, Judge Ted Baca, uh, Arnold Melba Hess, uh, Chris Lucero, who uh, was a lawyer up in Taos and then became an author, and now I think is practicing law uh, down here, downtown. Those are just some of the members of that football team. Wasn't Michael Allered on that team? Too? Uh, no, that Michael was later. Uh, uh, but Joe, uh, Joe was. Uh, Judge Allered was. <laughs> So who were some of the other uh, uh, members of your football team that you coached that later became lawyers? 
Well, like the ones that I the, the ones that I uh, uh, that I mentioned, um, I think that there must have been some others, but I don't remember uh, right offhand, uh, Terry. But so, with all of those guys on your team, how did you do? We came in second in the state. We lost by one point to uh, St. Michael's of Santa Fe uh, on, a, on, a, on a missed extra point. So that was that was a pretty good football team. It really was. And what position did you play when you were playing both? I played both ways. I played a quarterback on uh, on offense, and I played safety on defense. Right. And the time that you spent on the district court bench, you said you, that you got appointed in 1975. Mm -hmm. And you stayed there until when? Uh, until 1981. I resigned in 1981. Right. What were the circumstances around your resignation? The uh, state had passed a mandatory sentencing law, and uh, one of the uh, crimes uh, which bore a mandatory sentence was assault with a deadly weapon. And uh, I had a case of a young man uh, who um, was uh, uh, convicted of that uh, crime and the jury, without me saying so, uh, came in and uh, said guilty, but we recommend leniency, not knowing, of course, there was a mandatory sentence. And um, after uh, I got a pre-sentence report, which showed that this young man's record was better than mine, <laughs> uh, I didn't think that jail time was uh, appropriate. And uh, so upon a motion being duly made by defense counsel, I ruled the mandatory sentencing uh, provision unconstitutional as being a violation of separation of powers. Uh, specifically, I also thought that it was unconstitutional as far as equal protection of the laws, but in any event, I sentenced him to the period of time, and then I suspended it. And then, uh, it's kind of convoluted, but in a, in a, in a case, uh, not, not that case, but in a, uh, another case, that I also happened to be the uh, judge on and gave the person the, the, the whole sentence, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court on its own said that uh, mandatory sentencing was constitutional and then sent back the, uh, the, the, the case to me to resentence this young man that I put on probation. And I resigned. I said, let somebody else do it. I won't do it. That must have raised uh, lots of issues for you and Glenny and the people who were close to you. You know, not really. Uh, I, 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 yeah, it was very clear to me. Uh, you know, I, I've said in, in, in talks, and, and, I, and I really mean this, whenever getting and keeping a job, any job becomes more important than doing it to the best of your ability. The job probably isn't worth ha having in the first place. And I really believe that. And of course there was some concern, well, what am I going to do now? But I wasn't really concerned about that. I, I'd had a successful practice before, and I said, we'll do it again. And there may be a, a, a lull, but we're going to be all right. Uh, uh, I don't want to spend the rest of my life with a razor blade in my hand every morning where the chances are 50-50 that I'm going to shave or cut my throat. I'm just not going to do that, and we're going to live that way. So uh, this is the way we're going to go. And I started a new law firm, and uh, we went at it again, and, and, it, and it turned out very, very well. So how long were you in private practice until you went uh, to the Supreme Court? Well, t before I went on the district bench, it was 15 years, and then when I, when I, after I resigned from the bench, I practiced another nine and a half years before I went on the Supreme Court. I didn't want to do that either, as a matter of fact, but that's, that's another story. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll get to the Supreme Court in just a second. In those 25 years of private practice, mm -hmm. uh, what cases that you haven't already talked to us about mm -hmm. did you find the most interesting or the most challenging? Uh, there, were, there were a number of them. One of the ones that sticks out in, uh, in my mind was, uh, was, was a case of Hole versus Womack, which was the defense counsel in that case was, was Lou Sutton. And this was a bus company case 
where this bus stopped at a driveway rather than at a bus stop. And the lady stepped off, and it was in December, and it was dark, and she really tore, the, uh, tore her, her, her leg up. And um, the principle, the thing that made it interesting was is that the law, uh, New Mexico hadn't decided it yet, but for a common carrier for hire, they owe the highest degree of care to their passengers because their passengers are paying for it. And this was the law in California and a number of other states. New Mexico hadn't decided it. And so we got to go to the jury, and I was arguing uh, before Judge McPherson that this was the highest degree of care. And Lou Sutton, who was an excellent lawyer and was the chairman of the UJIs, we see, New Mexico had no UJIs in those days. He used the California UJIs. Said it's not proper in New Mexico because we're a common law state and there are no degrees of negligence at common law. And his argument was you can't have degrees of, you can't have no degrees of, of negligence at common law and say that the bus company, a transporter for hire, has the highest degree of care because negligence is the failure to use due care. And if you say a highest degree of care, you're saying that you have degrees of negligence. Pretty good argument. And McPherson wouldn't go for it. So he let it go to the jury, and I got a verdict. And up to the Supreme Court we go. And uh, made the argument in the, in the Supreme Court again. I said that the highest degree of care does not mean any degrees of negligence, but uh, don't kid yourself. If I'm a brain surgeon operating on somebody's brain, and I'm also a driver of my automobile. No, but nobody, for a practical sense, can say, uh, look, uh, I don't have a higher degree of care uh, practicing uh, surgery on a person's brain uh, than uh, just driving my car. Uh, and that isn't, the, that isn't a, a degrees of negligence. That's just, uh, uh, that's just another way of saying that uh, what's normal in that kind of a business is, is, uh, is what is required. The Supreme Court went for it. The most interesting part is that even today in the UJIs, okay, we don't say for transporters for hire, highest degree of care, there's a, that they have to use due care, and then there's a footnote at the end of this that says, <laughs> and you're probably aware of this, uh, it's one of the factors that you should consider. So I don't know whether I won or lost that case. I won. I got the verdict, but I, I didn't win or lose that case. Any other cases that stand out in your mind? Yeah, there was a case, Jaramillo versus Anaconda. These are all in the Supreme Court, where um, at Cebolleta, New Mexico, west of here, they were blasting uh, for uranium. And Cebolleta had a number of houses, all adobe houses. And this particular client's house began to crack. And so we sued uh, the mining company uh, at, uh, that was blasting out at Cebolleta because this was a dangerous instrumentality and all you had to prove, you didn't have to prove negligence, you could be as careful as you wanted to be, but if the blast caused the damage, <clears throat> you had to pay. <clears throat> and so there was, um, this case lasted several weeks. And it wasn't a big case. We got a verdict, <clears throat> and the damages, I think, were $7,500. The important thing was that there was about nine other people in Cebollata waiting to see how this case was going to come out, and the statute of limitations was running. Okay? So none of those other people actually, I don't know whether they went out and settled with them uh, or not, but the argument was uh, that uh, the blasting didn't cause the damage. I mean, that's their only defense. And they had this expert witness who came in from back east somewhere. And you couldn't ask for a better expert witness. I mean, this guy, <laughs> under oath, said things like, I have more <clears throat> information in my portfolio on the effects of blasting than the entire United States Bureau of Mines. And he also said, I was the man who figured out how to make a tunnel under the state capital of Tennessee without one pebble or one brick 
being damaged at all in that, in that tremendous Capitol building in Tennessee, and I did all of the blasting for it. Very impressive. And you know it was true. I mean, the guy had more. <laughs> and so that's the kind of a conflict we had. So I said, I have to do something with this jury. And I get up and I said, you know, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have been honored. You have met a man here today who has told you under oath that he has more information than the entire United States Bureau of Mines. This is a man who speaks only to God and just by appointment. His, not God's. And then, <laughs> it, was a, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, I thought the opposing counsel was going to kill me. And I, luckily, he had gone back to wherever he was going to, because he would have done it if the other <laughs> lawyers had <laughs> But that, that case is in the, uh, uh, the Supreme Court, too. The, the argument that the defense counsel was, um, was making was that the physical facts were such that the jury could not find that it caused the damage. And the Supreme Court said, oh yes, that's, this isn't a physical facts rule, this is just up to the jury. But those are two cases out of many. <laughs> um, during the period of time that you were on the bench, about six years, the district court mm -hmm. bench, about six years, uh, aside from the case that you described before where you had the sentencing issue, Mm -hmm. uh, what other memorable cases uh, come to mind? Uh, one that comes to mind is the case of Goff versus Pharmacia Laboratories. That, that case is also, I believe, in the Court of Appeals. Uh, cert was not granted. But that's a case where <clears throat> the test for medical testimony and medical malpractice cases was changed by, from the strict locality rule to what the standard of care is nationally. Uh, I was the district judge, and the law in that, uh, at that time was um, that uh, it was the, the strict locality rule, unless you had a doctor in the same profession, in the same, uh, in the, in the same uh, specialty, testifying against another doctor in New Mexico that he was negligent or did not follow the standard of care uh, you couldn't get to the jury. And there was a motion for summary judgment made. And I ruled that the law was clear in New Mexico. But then I went on for two pages in the record saying, I think this law should be changed. I think it definitely should be looked at. And uh, it just rankled me that the standard in New Mexico was something less than it was uh, nationally. You know, how dare you be that? <laughs> anyway. I uh, went up to the Supreme Court, uh, went up to the Court of Appeals, and Lou Sutton wrote the opinion and reversed it. And it wasn't, and it wasn't uh, appealed to the, uh, to the Supreme Court, and it, it came back, and now we have the, we have the uh, general rule rather than the strict locality rule in New Mexico. You know, I remember when I first came to town meeting you, and you were a district court judge at that time. Mm -hmm. It was 1977. Mm -hmm. And I also remember meeting Maggie. <laughs> Uh, she was your uh, uh, everything. Everything. Yes. Uh, how did she help you do what you needed to do? She protected me, and she also chastised me when I wasn't doing the right thing. If if I made her angry, all right, uh, she would send people in to see me about every thirty two seconds, and I would have to run out and say, Maggie, I don't know what I did, but I'm sorry. Would you just <laughs> leave me alone? Let me get some work done. <laughs> But Maggie was, uh, was really uh, tremendous. She was my secretary before I went on the bench. And she had been a secretary for a man who uh, uh, was in private practice in Colorado and became a judge in Colorado. And she wouldn't go. And I asked her to go with me, and she hemmed and hawed, but she finally went with me. And uh, she, I think she's famous uh, for being a secretary. Not only was she my secretary, but after I left, she was uh, Judge Deaton's secretary. She was Judge Woody Smith's secretary. She was Judge um, Brennan's secretary. And she was uh, Judge, um, she's passed away now, uh, uh, secretary. She's still there. Uh, she's not a secretary for a judge anymore, but she's working in the uh, main office at the uh, at the courthouse, I think she's 
close to being retired. But Maggie's a Maggie, Maggie's an icon of uh, of uh, clerks and, uh, and and secretaries in that courthouse. How did you get to become a Supreme Court judge? <laughs> Uh, Justice Ken Wilson had been appointed by Governor Carruthers uh, to the Supreme Court, um, and he was a Republican. Good judge. I think he did an, an excellent job. And uh, he had to run in that one partisan election. And there was only one Democrat who was, who was announcing uh, for the Democratic nomination to the Supreme Court and uh, it's a lady named Francesca Lovato in, uh, in Santa Fe. And I was concerned uh, that uh, this uh, was not going to be the right nominee. And uh, I was concerned about this, the Supreme Court. And I started calling people. <laughs> uh, trying to get them to run for that office. Uh, and there's uh, any number of them that I, that I called, and each one of them had one excuse or another for not doing it. And the last one I called was Rosie R. Sanchez. And I said, Rosie, uh, by the way, he was at Georgetown too, uh, getting his master's when I was getting my, uh, my, my first degree at, at the law school. I said, Rosie, you've got to do this. You know, you just got to. And he, no, no, he wasn't going to do it. And I was really at my wits end, and he, he uh, said, well, damn it, if you're so interested in that, why don't you, why don't you do it? And in a fit of peak, <laughs> honestly, I said, okay, I will. This was January. By March, you're supposed to have 3,720 signatures of Democrats who says, if this turkey runs, I'll vote for him. <laughs> so I go home, and I say, Glenny, we're running for the Supreme Court. We need 3,720 signatures by March the 15th. Uh, and I'm leaving for Boston tomorrow, and I'll be gone for a week <laughs> taking some depositions. That's when she didn't talk to me for a, a month and a half. Make a long story short, she got something in excess of 12,000 signatures in that short period of time. <laughs> And I, uh, I uh, won the election in the primary against Francesca Lovato, and then I beat uh, Ken Wilson, in the, and that's how I became a Supreme Court Justice. Give us an overview of your career as a Supreme Court Justice in New Mexico, and then maybe we'll go back and talk about some more details. I was uh, blessed uh, by going on to the court at a time where I think it was, other people called it the Camelot Court. My wife is, is also called it the Camelot Court. And there was, um, when, I, when I first went on, there was uh, Justice uh, uh, Sosa, uh, there was uh, uh, Justice Ransom, uh, there was Justice Baca, there was uh, 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 me, and, uh, and there was... Um, uh, Justice uh, Montgomery, and finally the the the, the court was uh, was uh, Baca, uh, uh, Frost, Montgomery, Ransom, and me, and that was one of the most <clears throat> delightful experiences. Not that we uh, always agreed because we didn't, but we all knew each other and had known each other and had great respect for each other for many 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 years. And those conferences were um, uh, really enlightening and, and, and delightful because we would really get into it. And we weren't uh, gentle, but we always had great respect for one another. And I think that court put out some of the great opinions in the history of, of the state of New Mexico. And the reason I say that is ALR, as you know, the American Law Reporter. That period of time that we were on there, uh, I, I counted them at one time, but between the five of us, we must have had 14 or 15 cases reported in ALR second, which are the cases in the area that they print them in uh, for the whole country. Uh, trends. 
And that was, uh, that was the most delightful thing. Uh, we're running out of tape. We need to change sure. the tape, so we'll go yeah. off the record for a short okay. period of time. Okay, Terry. We're back on the record now. Uh, Gene, we were talking about the Camelot Court and yeah. the various different decisions that uh, made uh, that were of national record through the ALRs. Mm -hmm. Um, can you tell us, without divulging any uh, secrets, how the Supreme Court, during your day, would discuss a case, come to a decision as to how a case should be decided? Sure. When the case is filed in the, uh, in the Supreme Court of the state of New Mexico, it is assigned an author uh, automatically. It's done by rote. Uh, and then uh, it's set for briefing and it's set for oral arguments. And then after the oral arguments, uh, you meet in what they call the Holy of Holies, right behind, right behind the Supreme Court bench. And the youngest member of the panel, who is not the author, goes first and it goes around the table. And the questions are two. Uh, how would you decide this case and why? And as you go around the table, you will find out, number one, how the thing is going to come out. But you'll also decide, number two, whether or not there's going to be a, a dissent. And number three, what are the issues that are going to be developed and how are they going to be developed? And then um, the process starts. And the opinions are written, and then they are distributed throughout. And, and, and as the signatures are collected, and the, di and the errors and omissions are made, and the editing is made, and the different, uh, uh, different language is used, it finally culminates in the opinion, which is then signed and, and published. And those conferences uh, are, 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 are excellent um, uh, forums. Uh, to um, see where the thinking is and where where the uh, 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 linkage is as far as as deciding these cases are concerned, and you can go in there thinking one thing and thinking diametrically something else. One of the things that hardly ever changes the opinion of a justice is the oral argument. Okay, uh, but those conferences do, <laughs> and those conferences are very educational experience. And uh, uh, when you're serving with the kind of men that I'm talking about serving with, and you hear their legal reasoning and their way of writing and their way of d of describing what it is that's uh, uh, important to them, it's like taking a refreshing shower. It really is, and that isn't always the way it is. Um, it's a forced partnership at best, and you're lucky when you get a combination like I was fortunate enough to have uh, for a portion of that time of, uh, of, of, of uh, people that have uh, uh, good minds and even greater hearts and the ability to, uh, to converse with one another. And it's, it's an experience that's uh, unique. I never thought I'd have it, and, and I'm so glad that I did. <laughs> What happens if the appointed author mm -hmm. is not in favor of the opinion? He it, becomes a dissenter. He becomes a dissenter. But does that person write the opinion anyway? No. Then the, the one who is in the majority, uh, who happens to be next in line, will write the opinion for the, for the court. And the, That hardly ever happens. That hardly ever happens. Uh, Again, without disclosing any any secrets, uh, is there any of those uh, any kind of funny things that happened that you could? Oh tell yeah, us about? lots of funny things. I, yeah, I don't know whether I can tell you about them, but <laughs> there's a lot of funny things. I I, I remember one time uh, when I was first there, and I was not the author, and I was the youngest one in the member. In the case, I don't even remember what the case was about. I said, but I said I would decide this case for this reason uh, and in this way. And my friend uh, Dick Ransom said uh, something to the effect, it's got to be the dumbest reason I've ever heard in my life. 
And I said, do you think I can, you can do better? And he says, yeah, I think so. I said, what do you got to say about it? And uh, he was right. <laughs> and he did do better. But he changed, uh, he didn't change my mind, but the way he got there was a little bit different and a heck of a lot better. But uh, that kind of thing happens uh, from, from time to time. But even when there's a conflict and there is a, um, a real difference of, of, of opinion, uh, it isn't a cause for any anger or anything else. I mean, this is an issue that's being decided by this court for the first time. And as you know, uh, as a lawyer, uh, there are, uh, there, you can go both ways. And the thing that stands the test of time is the reasoning behind it. Uh, and the precedence behind it. Uh, and you, sometimes you have to choose and, and sometimes a minority view uh, will not be the majority view of that court and vice versa. Sometimes the majority view of that court will not be the, in conjunction with a minority view uh, that other states hold. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real experience. You retired from the Supreme Court when? In 2002, the last day of December 2002. Oh, and so you went on in 1988. So 90. Uh, ni 90. 90. Mm -hmm. So you're on for about 12 years. 12 years. So. Mm -hmm. uh, during that 12-year period, uh, to your mind, mm -hmm. what were the most significant cases that you were involved in? I wrote uh, uh, Byers, the Byers case and, and the Sears versus Nissan case. One was when New Mexico, after 40 years, uh, adopted as a measure of damages the uh, uh, loss of consortium, spousal loss of consortium, and also children's loss of consortium of their parents if they were killed uh, in a wrongful death action. Uh, it also establishes or established the, um, the in Nissan, the, uh, or, 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 or whether it was, uh, it may have been Romero's versus Bayer, the value of the life itself, from taking it off from a pure economic uh, standpoint, what is the value of a life if that life is taken through the negligence uh, of another? Another one that I wrote toward the end of uh, my stay there was the Delgado case of uh, intentional uh, actions of employers uh, that are uh, of, of such a nature that they are taken out of workers' compensation and into the tort area. Um, those are three that stick out in my mind. I was very happy to hear about the Romero and Byers case because it was my case. Uh -huh. and, uh, I remember that. <laughs> the, uh, the gentleman that died in that case was one of these extraordinary human beings, mm -hmm. Mr. Romero, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, I just felt compelled. Mm -hmm. Knowing what the law was, I felt compelled to challenge that. And uh, I was very impressed by, by the reasoning and, of course, very happy with it. <laughs> and Terry Ward's case was the uh, Sears Nissan case, yeah. the uh -huh. companion case with that. Yeah. Um, what do you think the most difficult case was for you while you were on the Supreme Court? I think the most difficult cases uh, for me uh, were in the area of uh, the criminal law. Um, for example, there is just no clear distinction in the state of New Mexico between first and second degree murder. And the reason for it was not a legislative error, but I think was an error on the part of the Supreme Court many years ago. Murder in the first degree is the killing of one human being by another human being uh, that's deliberate and premeditated. That's what the statute says. Uh, the Supreme Court, and I can't remember the exact case, decided that deliberation included premeditation, which I think is a monumental error, so that the net result is, is that every intentional killing of one human being by another human being is potentially a first degree murder case. Say, so what? Well, so what? This is a heck of a difference uh, in the penalties. And particularly the death penalty. See, the death penalty in New Mexico has caused me great problems because uh, it's not important that I'm 
in favor or against the death penalty. Everybody knows I'm probably against, I am against the death penalty. But it causes me problems because it has to be first degree murder to be the death penalty. And in, in, in New Mexico, it isn't how you kill somebody that gets you the death penalty, but who you kill. You kill a policeman deliberately while he or she is on duty, that can cause the death penalty. Uh, if, you come, if you kill a, a, a person who's a witness, that can be the death penalty. If it, can, if it is a killing of one prisoner by another prisoner in the penitentiary, that's the death penalty. Um, and and uh, if it's so easy to have first degree murder, so you can have second degree murder of a policeman, second degree murder of a penitentiary. And because there's that difference, uh, those, those cases have caused me some, uh, some concern. And even to this day, it's not, uh, it's not completely cleared up. Um, those, uh, to answer your question specifically, that, that, that area uh, also uh, bothered me. And, and some of the new laws with regard to driving while intoxicated uh, have, 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 have concerned me. Um, mainly because of the mandatory increased sentences that have caused, and I'm not a, I, I, as you know, I'm, I'm a really serious opponent of mandatory sentencing, because I, I just don't think it gets the job done. You talked before when you first went into practice about the collegiality and the willingness of even opposing counsel in the middle of a trial to help help you out as a young lawyer. <coughs> Excuse me. It also sounds like that same type of collegiality and same type of cooperation was there while you were in the Supreme Court. Oh, yeah. It feels in the practice of law today that that's not there. What do you think happened? You mean not there in the practice of law or not there on the court? <laughs> not there in the practice of law. Okay. I don't know what happens. On I the court. think, like we started this, Terry, I think one of the main reasons is the, the, the numbers. Uh, how many people are practicing the law today and how diverse their practices are. <clears throat> Nobody's really a street lawyer anymore. They, they, they're, they're specialists, and it's a, it is a series of specialists practicing specialized areas. And there's a lot of them. And if you don't know somebody, if you don't know each other like we know each other, uh, it's impossible to like each other. And if you can't like each other, you certainly can't trust each other. And if you can't trust each other, then you have a war from the very beginning to the very end, and it, don't, it never gets better, it always gets worse. Um, the rules of procedure, both civil and criminal, we haven't talked about this, but I don't know why, and I'm guilty, mea culpa also, but it gets, there's more and more and more and more rules. And the theory is, is that if you pass these rules, it's going to make the practice of law easier. That is, at worst, a lie, <laughs> and at best, a misconception. I've never seen Passing more and more rules make anything any easier. It just makes everything a little bit more difficult. Judge Ashby, who was a, and is a, a very good friend of mine, used to call the rules of civil procedure the rules of civil harassment. <laughs> and he may be, he, he, he may be, and he may be correct. But the way that the the, the law has expanded, the rules of practice have expanded. Um, has has caused uh, has caused this problem. We didn't need rules of ethics. <laughs> we didn't need rules of professionalism. Uh, you just knew it. I mean, uh, it, it's kind of I've I teach uh, at times courses on professionalism and, and and courses on ethics. And and sometimes I wonder why do you, what you know didn't these people have any parents? <laughs> <laughs> how, how come we have to talk about these things? Well, we do have to talk about them because uh, it's uh, it, it's something that's uh, that's very important, and it can be the death knell of this profession. It really can. Back in the early days, when there were so many. Uh, 
fewer lawyers. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the legal community really knew just about everybody in the community. Mm -hmm. Uh, there weren't the ethics decisions and the, mm -hmm. uh, the focus on professionalism that, that you've referenced. How did the community deal with unethical lawyers? How did the community deal, the legal community I'm talking about? They went out of lawyers? business. They went out of business. Nobody hired them. Nobody hired them. Uh, it was a very small community. And if somebody uh, put it to somebody else, and they, and they were a lawyer, or for that matter, a doctor or an engineer or an accountant or anybody else. Everybody knew about it, and they moved. <laughs> or they, they, they went down the tubes uh, uh, financially. Um, also, if somebody... This doesn't happen anymore either. I wish that it did. Uh, but it's because it's too big now. But if somebody was stepping over the line or, 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 or was acting questionably, uh, the older lawyers uh, would say, hey, how about uh, let's go out and have a cup of coffee or let's go to lunch and let's have a talk. And th they would have a talk and say, you know, cut this crap out. What are you, what are you doing? Uh, you know. Uh, this is uh, th this is a profession. This isn't a this this isn't a war. What do you what, what are you what are you trying to prove? Um, there's no hiding the ball or anything like that. Uh, it was it was just a, a more open uh, and more uh, c a congenial atmosphere that, uh, for one reason or another, as we've talked about, doesn't ha doesn't happen so much today. Along that line, uh, I've heard some attorneys say that part of the reason that we need these ethics rules and professionalism guidelines, those type of things, is that the judges have not been tough enough on attorneys uh, who either step over the line or participate in what was commonly called Rambo-style litigation. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> but you're going to run out of tape again. <laughs> um, for, 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 for starters, <clears throat> um, there is a feeling out there, and it's probably true, that federal judges uh, are more strict and tougher about enforcing the rules than state judges. And that's probably true, but you've got to look uh, at uh, how uh, the judges get there and stay there. Um, the political forces, uh, unfortunately, are a lot stronger on uh, state judges than they are on federal judges. Uh, and therefore, uh, they, uh, federal judges, uh, don't have the problems uh, that state judges have when it comes up for uh, uh, partisan elections or, for that matter, uh, retention elections. Um, Public opinion be damned as far as the federal court is concerned. It, it, it can't be damned as far as the state courts are, are concerned. And if you uh, uh, get crosswise with a uh, big enough percentage of the bar, uh, those people can really hurt you and, and can. But also remember this, and I've taught these courses too. Professionalism is a two-way street. Of course, the lawyers have a duty and responsibility professionally uh, to the public, uh, to the courts, and to one another. <laughs> but so do the courts. So do the courts. And judges, sometimes, after they get to that position, uh, maybe it's something in the robes, but they get the idea that they are unassailable and they can treat people, particularly lawyers, in a fashion that uh, they shouldn't be doing it. Um, for example, if you're going to uh, chew out a lawyer, you never do it in front of his client. You never do it in front of opposing counsel. Never. It's absolutely unacceptable. If you have something to say to a lawyer, bring him in and, 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 and tell him uh, in, in such a way that it will be beneficial. I'll give you a story. Remember Charlie Driscoll? Sure. God love him. Uh, wonderful person. Excellent trial lawyer. And an excellent law teacher. I was on the bench for six months. And I'm trying this case. It was a rape case. And uh, 
Charlie is the defense lawyer. And Charlie is a good defense lawyer, is trying the case and the judge. Because this is a new turkey on the bench, all right? So we're going to pluck a few feathers. And I put up with it for the better part of about two days, okay? And then I said, this has got to stop. So we take a break, and I send the jury out, and I said, Mr. Driscoll, I'd like to see you in chambers. And I leave my robes on, and I take my gavel, and I walk back into chambers. And Charlie comes in, and he says, yes, sir. I said, relax, Charlie. You're doing a hell of a job out there. But when we go back out, when I pick up this mallet, that's your cue to go into action. And he says, what do you mean? I said, when I pick up this mallet, I want you to take your right ear and your left hand and your left ear and your right hand and pull your head out of your ass or I'm going to plant this mallet right between your eyes. <laughs> no more problems. And we've been great friends before and we've been great friends ever since. But see, you don't have to hold people in contempt. Um, uh, and you don't have to be uh, uh, difficult or in the, in, the, in, the, in the phrase of the day, a hard ass. Uh, there are other ways to do that, and there are other ways that uh, you can treat one another to where you never get to that point where it becomes uh, as acrimonious as sometimes it has. So. Uh, you talked about elections and re now what we have, retention elections. Semi. Uh, uh, Semi-retention <laughs> elections. Uh, do you have a feeling whether or a belief as to one system being better than the other? No. There are any number of systems in the United States. They all have their pluses and they all have their, uh, they all have their minuses. Uh, I am uh, opposed to out-and-out -out election of judges because it is so susceptible to uh, public opinion and um, you really can't let uh, a person, if you're a judge, your personal opinions, whether they be political, religious, or otherwise, affect your judgment as to what the law is and, 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 and applying it. Uh, and uh, I don't like appointments for life uh, because uh, human beings get old and they get uh, uh, sick and they get uh, uh, stayed in their ways. And so uh, that kind of a, of a system uh, has, its, uh, has its drawbacks. As far as systems go, um, this system that we have is probably the, uh, uh, the closest to a combination of the two. Uh, but even, a, um, even uh, the uh, election by retention has got its, its faults. I'm thinking of, uh, of a Supreme Court justice uh, by the name of White who was on the Tennessee Supreme Court. Brilliant lady. Very good judge. And she did not write the opinion, but she joined in an anti -death, in a death penalty case where they reversed the death penalty. And the pro-death penalty people in Tennessee just pillaged her. Um, in New Mexico, we have to have 57%, which I think probably is unconstitutional under the federal constitution. But it really doesn't make any difference whether it's 57 or 50. Uh, if, if they want to get you, if, if you've got an organization that really wants to give you, get you, whether it's DWI or death penalty or whatever, or domestic violence, you just pick it. Happens to be the hot issue of the day, and they've got money, and they really want to go after a particular judge, they can get him or her. Uh, and uh, that's, that's a problem. Uh, because if it scares the judicial officer into ruling not according to what the law is or what he thinks or she thinks the law is, but rather uh, that uh, uh, what the opinion of the appointing authority or the electing authority is, uh, that's when the rule of law gets really shaky and you got some real problems with that. I do. Uh, I'm going to go back to something you said just a couple of minutes ago in your last answer. Mm -hmm. You said that you can't let personal opinions affect your judgment no, sir. regarding the law. That's one of the criticisms mm -hmm. that's been leveled towards you, is that you're too much based or have been too much based in your personal opinion as, as opposed to the strict dictates of the law. How would you respond to that? Well, I don't know exactly uh, what... Uh, what what that is? Uh, I am a forceful person. Oh, really? <laughs> well, no, I, I've got a very strong personality, but but I've got to tell you that I have never in my life intentionally I, on the bench uh, 
let my personal views, whether they be religious or political, affect my judgment in a case. I have a tendency, as you can see, to use strong language. I write strongly when I, when I write opinions. And sometimes I think maybe uh, because I write like I do and I talk like I do, that uh, I come across <clears throat> too strongly. And, uh, and because of that, uh, people may think, well, I, I'm letting my personal beliefs uh, uh, influence. Uh, I was born and raised and educated a Catholic. And although I may have very definite opinions based upon faith about certain things like uh, abortion, uh, that doesn't affect the way I would decide a uh, law if, uh, or, or a case uh, in, involving that issue. And I have always said, and I, and I have maintained it, that if you can't do that, you shouldn't be there. And that's one of the reasons I quit in 1981, uh, because that really bothered my conscience. Uh, I had a very strong belief, personal belief, even as a matter of conscience, that, that a judge's job in the criminal law was before he or she sentenced an individual who was convicted of a crime, they must consider the circumstances surrounding the offender and the circumstances surrounding the offense. And that that function was purely a judicial one in nature. And when the legislature passes a law that takes that discretion and that judgment away from the judges and puts it in the hands of all people, the district attorney, that affected me so greatly that it really became a matter of conscience for me. And I couldn't, in good conscience, apply that law in the cases that were going to come to me from then on. So I did what I thought was the best thing for everybody, including me, and quit, okay? Um, if, if a person, let me give you a, a, a there's a, that, that judge in, in the South who wanted to put, and became a Supreme Court justice, I think in Alabama, the Ten about the Ten Commandments. If that man, as a matter of conscience, was so set on that obviously illegal rule, all right, which it clearly it, 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 it had been, then he had only one way to go, and that's to get off the bench, like I did, okay? But not to sit there and say, I don't care, Supreme Court, what you say the law is. I'm going to say the law is this way. I've never done that, and I never, and I never would do that. But if, 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 if they say that this is the law, and I can't live with it as a matter of conscience, and I'm on the bench, I have only one way to go. <laughs> Get out. And that's, that, 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 that's what I'm saying. Okay. And um, if... Um, if I give the impression, or I have given the impression, or by my writings in, uh, in, in the Supreme Court, that my personal uh, uh, feelings or, or personal beliefs, whether they be political or, uh, or, or religious, affected my judgments, um, that's news to me. I, 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 I just don't remember ever doing that. And if I did, they should have thrown me off a long time ago. <laughs> You know, you remind me a little bit of a sign that was in uh, Judge Woody Smith's mm -hmm. chambers. Uh, that, uh, and you've probably seen it. That says, "If it ain't fair, it ain't legal." <laughs> it's right. It's right. <laughs> anyway, was that like a standard that 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 you applied? You know, the law is based upon reason, and uh, uh, um, reason. Uh, as opposed to rationality, is, 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 a, is a search, it really is a search for the truth, as closely as we can get it in, 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 this, uh, in this day and age and how the, how the circumstances are. And the truth is always fair. And so if it ain't fair, it can't be the law because it can't stand the test of reason. And that's, that's really where that comes from, I think. And I agree with that. Now, you've, you've partially answered this question through a number of your answers during this interview, but I'm going to ask you to see if you have anything to add to it. What makes for a good trial, a good jury trial? 
Oh, geez. Um, I'll tell you what makes for a good trial judge. What makes for a good trial judge are three things, and only three things. You got to be there, you got to listen, and you got to rule. Um, and if you don't do any one of those three things, particularly rule, then the rule of law and the whole system starts to fail. The trial lawyers who are trying a case before a jury must do three things. First of all, in the opening statements, they must let the jury know what they think, the lawyers think, the evidence will prove. The second thing they have to do is present the evidence through the testimony and through the documents that they have. And at the end, they have to bring all of this together so that the jury can understand this story. What a jury trial is, is the telling of a story. The judge, with the help of the lawyers, has the obligation to inform them that they have to find out the facts and that they must apply the facts to the law as he gives it to them. And the lawyers have to work as hard as they can to see that that job is done. More often than not, the job gets done. The sad thing is today, there are fewer and fewer and fewer jury trials being tried for any number of reasons. Uh, and that's a problem. I'm talking against myself now. I do a lot of mediations, as you well know. Uh, and mediation has its place. But when it keeps the really good cases from being tried, what happens is that the law doesn't change. It just sits there and vegetates. Because unless a, an attorney tries a case, and that case is appealed, and the, fi and the final decision is made by the Supreme Court of the jurisdiction, whether it be New Mexico or any other state. That's the way the law progresses. And it's really detrimental to the whole system. It's detrimental to lawyers when I come in and they say, Terry, here's, here's what happened. What do you think? And you've got to tell them, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, because it hasn't been decided yet. So that's the downsides of this. Um, I see a lot of trial judges today, and I'm not naming any names, but then it's across the country, it's just not New Mexico. They have become docket managers instead of trial judges, okay? And I'm saying, you know, they're looking for ways to let somebody else take care of this case, whether it's through mediation or it's arbitration. And, and, and what it is is it's shoveling paper around from one, one place to another, not deciding cases, not, not getting them uh, going and not getting, not getting them tried. And I think that's detrimental to the whole system. That feeds into the perception mm -hmm. that uh, the, the courts have been clogged with too many particularly personal injury cases. Mm -hmm. That seems to have been a common point of discussion through the 90s and in the 2000s. Uh, what's your opinion on that? I don't think that there's uh, that it's any more clogged today than, uh, uh, than, it, than it ever was. Um, in the area of the criminal law, uh, just for an example, and it doesn't take a genius to figure this out. Let's take DWI, for example. If you do certain things, if you lower I'm not saying this is good or bad, but if you lower the blood alcohol content from 0.1 to 0.08, what does that do? The potential is there to double, triple, and maybe even quadruple the number of cases. If you then add time, mandatorily, to a conviction for those sentences after first, second, third, fourth offense, what does that do? That increases the number of cases that you have to try. You ain't got enough judges. You don't have enough lawyers. You don't have enough DAs to try that number of cases. And guess what? Then we have in the papers, oh, 50% of the cases have been dismissed. Well, what are you, why is that such a surprise to you? You can't get them tried. And if you have a mandatory sentencing, I'm not going to plead guilty. I'm going to plead not guilty, and you've got to try me. And then we pass a rule, Supreme Court does, that you've got to try these things within a year or six months, or whatever the case is. Can't be done. 
And so what happens to them is they go down the tubes. And guess what suffers? Justice suffers. And the administration of justice suffers. And they're still trying to figure out, why did that happen? <laughs> you caused it. <laughs> you see, it, 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 that's, that's, and it happens in civil cases, uh, in civil cases as well. Um, you've got a case and you file it. And it's a simple, straightforward case. The, the case ought to be tried within the next six or eight months. But then you go into mediation and you go into arbitration and then you have these discovery rules and pretty soon this little case becomes a monster. Uh, like the judge in D.C. who lost his pants. They should have shot that guy <laughs> the second week of this case. But you, this, all of a sudden it becomes a monumental thing when it's a really uh, straightforward kind of a case. And it happens both in civil and in, and in, uh, and in uh, criminal cases. The big clog in the courts today, both federal and state, are drug cases, criminal cases, closely followed by DWI and domestic violence. And in the civil area, it's big corporate cases, big business cases. And they're talking about millions and millions and millions of dollars that tie up courts for years, years. And who takes the brunt of it is poor guys like you that have the other kind of cases that are standing in line because of this clog. And they're blaming you for the clog and you're not responsible for the clog. It's somebody else's cases. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've felt that for a long time. It's true. Um, when you were on the Supreme Court, did you uh, go to the legislature on behalf of the courts? Yes, sir. Did you find the legislature receptive to some of the problems that you've been talking about? Uh, yes, uh, and but they weren't for a long, long time. Uh, uh, the um, One of the things that I'm most proud of from a non-case um, standpoint is the establishment of the unified budget. Uh, this is a thought that I had 25 years ago uh, and it came to fruition when I finally got on the Supreme Court and then I became Chief Justice, is what happens is this. We have 13 judicial districts in the state of New Mexico. And depending upon who you have in the legislature, some of those districts have more powerful representatives than others. And they would go up to the state legislature on a, on a uh, annual basis or a semi-annual basis. Uh, and they would start lobbying the legislature for things like pay increases, uh, increased uh, budgets, so forth and so on. And what happens is, is that the leg that is the jurisdictions that had the most powerful legislators or senators got it and the other ones didn't. And for years you had this disparity uh, between, uh, between the various districts. And legislators like nothing better than conflict because they can say, well, I tried, but I just couldn't get it done. So we came up with the idea of a unified budget and all of the districts come into the Supreme Court and have a full discussion back and forth and they said, this is what is the best for the entire judiciary from judicial salaries to budgets and pay increases for help and so forth and so on and, and uh, uh, filing fees, everything from soup to nuts and give it to the legislature as a package and nobody's fighting within the family over this. This is our budget. Now you can say this is too much, this is too much, we ought to put more here and more there. That's fine. But this is a unified budget concept. And it takes away from the legislature the tendency to make an excuse that they have to choose between this and that, between the districts. They can change something within uh, the, the total budget, but it's a unified, it's a unified budget. And that was very, very effective. And to this day, from what I understand, they're still using that. And that's, uh, that's real beneficial. A few years ago, the um, Supreme Court Chief Justice uh, ordered uh, all of the presiding judges from the various districts not to come up to Santa Fe, which really, really frosted a bunch of people. And this doesn't do that. They, 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 they're, they're, they're free to come up, and they should come up. 
but it's to push the unified budget for the for the for the not for their just local, but for the for the jurisdiction as a whole, for the for the whole judiciary as a whole. Do you think our state is understaffed when it comes to trial court judges? Oh sure, uh, but they're getting better all the time. Uh, it's getting better all the time. Uh, I think every state is probably understaffed with all of these things that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. There just isn't enough people uh, to handle them if you really want to try these cases. And since they can't, they're doing other things with them. But sure. Do you think it's appropriate uh, to use alternative dispute resolution, uh, such as mediations and arbitrations, in the smaller cases, like here in Bernalillo County, cases 25,000 or less? Oh, sure. Uh, uh, do you think that's a, a good thing for the judiciary as well as the legal system? Oh, I think it's the, it's the best thing for the clients, <laughs> you know, because in mediation you can get some things done that the court can't do and that the lawyers can't do. And if you've got a competent mediator who, who, who knows how to me mediate and can put the cards on the table as to what, you know, you're, you're likely to expect and get the best uh, uh, deal for uh, everybody concerned, uh, sure, it, it, works, uh, it, it works wonders. And I think it's, it's very beneficial. Uh, uh, not all cases, though, are mediatable, and not all cases should be mediated. And to make that differentiation uh, takes the lawyers and the judge uh, uh, some time to weed through it. Uh, oftentimes in a mediation, what the mediator will tell you is that, well, the, there is this undecided point of law mm -hmm. that directly affects your case. And aren't you better off trying to get that resolved now when you don't know the answer? as opposed to trying the case and having to take it up to Santa Fe and get an answer that you might not be happy yeah. with. One of the first things I tell the people in a mediation, and I think you've heard this, I've been a judge at various levels during my lifetime. Let me tell you something that's going to make everybody real happy, especially the lawyers. I'm not judging this thing today. I'm not going to make any rulings in this case. Uh, what I'm going to do is show you a way both of you to cut your losses. <laughs> You're both going to lose. If this is a way of not having to go through a real formal, anxious type proceeding and probably come out worse than you are today. This is your one opportunity to avoid all of that nonsense and to get it done now. Uh, I think I've heard that. So uh, all right. And, 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 and it works, and it works because it's a good way to do things. Uh, all a client knows is what their lawyers have told them and their friends have told them about their case. If they didn't think they had a good case, they wouldn't have come to the lawyer and filed the thing in the first place. It's not the mediator's case to, or job to reinforce how good a case they have. What the mediator's job is to do is to tell them what the problems are. Because I have seen some of the greatest cases in the world go right down the tubes. I was the lawyer in some of them. Huh? It happens, and you well know it happens. There is no such thing as a perfect case. And if you have enough experience, you can tell them, these are some of the problems, you know. Uh, and, and, and so uh, these are the chances you take. How do you reconcile that position mm -hmm with what you said maybe about an hour ago, mm -hmm. that not enough cases are getting tried, the law is getting stagnant because not enough cases are being tried, not enough cases are being taken up to the Supreme Court. Your case, for example, uh, Romero uh, and Byers and Sears and Nissan, all right? Those cases were cases <clears throat> that involved two principles of law that were almost encased in concrete for a generation, both loss of consortium and value of the life itself. If it hadn't have been for the fact that the federal courts certified those cases to us, it probably still would not have been decided. All right? The loss of consortium case was based upon a New York case that was reversed by the Court of Appeals of New York 35 years ago, all right? And we're still here sucking with it 40 years later. Uh, the, the loss of, 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 of the value of life itself 
was based on a case caught of the Supreme Court also 30, 35 years ago called Stang uh, that nobody had, uh, had, had come up with. So here's what happens. You get that kind of a case, and you know that here is, is uh, a case uh, that's a significant case, and it's worth a lot of money. And you go to mediation, and the defense knows it too. And so the defense says, I'm going to put $2 million on the table to settle this case. And that's a lot of money, okay? And you don't know whether you're going to win it or lose it. Uh, but you know that uh, uh, if uh, you, it comes out the way you think it's going to come out and the law changes, this case could be worth $5 million. But it's going to cost you probably $344,000 to try it. Okay? Those are the things, and I'm not casting any, 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 any rocks, but those are the things that, 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 that come into play. I really want to hug the lawyer or hug the judge um, and really have great respect for them that take those chances and they go with it and like you went with it and uh, come out with the kind of, uh, of ruling you do because see you not only won that case and did something for Mr. Romero and his fa or his family his heirs but you have affected I don't know how many hundreds, perhaps thousands of cases uh, in the future. Uh, and that's, that's and not only did you do that, you, you did something that you don't even know that you did. <laughs> and let me tell you what it is. And Professor Ocalino, God love him, I, I think he's, he's terrific, pointed this out. We were the last state in the union to adopt loss of consortium. Okay? The last state of all the states. We are the first state to expand it tremendously, okay, uh, than, than any other state. All right, children, um, uh, uh, parents in fact, de facto parents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what we didn't say is how much is that worth? And that's what the juries have to decide. Well, that's the jury's problem. And that's the jury's problem. But but you see uh, you see the implications. Yeah. The, the principle I'm talking about, I think, still stands. But that's those are the things that come into play in the meantime. We've done a lot of talking, Gene, about uh, judges and cases and lawyers. I want to shift your attention to the the juries. Mm -hmm. You know, the 800-pound gorilla in the courtroom. Uh, do you believe that the juries or the jury systems have changed in you know your number of years of practice? Oh, I'm sure. Uh, I'm I'm sure that they have. Uh, I, I've got to tell you right off of the bat that I am a great believer and a great defender of of the jury system. Uh, but I think jurors have changed um, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, they are. Uh, more educated today if by the internet if nothing else and they are influenced by any number of other things that perhaps uh, 20 years ago or even 10 uh, did not have any influence on them uh, but I still say as, as, a, as a system and with the uh, uh, proper instructions of the court uh, it is a system that works uh, uh, better than uh, and certainly as well as uh, any, other, any other kind of a system uh, because it really is the community who uh, shapes the law and shapes the value of things uh, o over the long uh, period of time based upon legal principles. And I, uh, uh, although it's changed, I don't think that it has, uh, it, it has deteriorated. If anything, I think maybe it has gotten stronger. There is a, a belief particularly among plaintiffs, personal injury attorneys, that the insurance industry in corporate America have uh, had this stealth program in place to poison the jurors uh, against uh, plaintiffs and people who come into court looking mm -hmm. for money. Have you seen any evidence of that? Not in New Mexico, but I certainly have seen it in other states. Uh, I have seen it... Uh, be particularly true in the state of Texas where 
a quote, tort reform, close quote, uh, has uh, taken a hold of both their legislature and their courts to uh, such an extent that uh, it worries me about, uh, about the state of the law in, in, in those areas. Uh, but surely, uh, you know, the insurance companies have spent millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, to try to influence, uh, and they have influenced uh, in a number of areas, uh, jurors um, and juries. I don't see any particular effect like that uh, in, in New Mexico. You're always going to get uh, those juries who are more liberal in their evaluation depending upon their locale. Uh, in, in a particular state, you're always going to get that. But as a general rule of a, of a complete shift in the way juries act and the way uh, juries decide, um, I can't say that I've seen that in New Mexico. Um, I may be wrong, but I haven't seen it. Generally speaking, we've been, we've been pretty specific about the number of cases mm -hmm. or the types of cases you've handled, both as a practitioner and, and from the bench. Generally speaking, what do you think your most significant contribution has been to the practice of law or the legal community in the state of New Mexico? I'll leave it to you and the rest of those people uh, to decide. You know, I've... Um, I've tried to do what I thought was the right thing based on the law uh, from the very beginning to wherever this, uh, uh, this life of mine and this profession of mine uh, uh, winds up. And uh, I, I hope that uh, uh, when it's all over, uh, the best compliment that anybody can give anybody in this profession is, uh, I think he did uh, what he thought was right. One last question. Mm -hmm. Any words of wisdom to the younger attorneys, the attorneys who are just being admitted to the bar, the attorneys who are going out there and trying to set up their own practices? Uh, the best of luck. Uh, and don't forget why you became a lawyer in the first place. And that's to make sense out of this life and to help uh, those people who uh, just don't have the ability or the money to help themselves. All right. Before we close, is there anything else that you'd like to ask? I've been asking you lots of questions. No. <laughs> no. no. Uh, this was a lot longer than I thought it was going to be. Well, actually, it was just about the same amount of time as I thought it was going okay. to be, right about two hours. A, Gene, I want to thank you so much sure. it's my for pleasure. your willingness to come in and, and share what is obviously some very personal things, as well as your perspective uh, from both sides of the bench. And uh, I thank you again yep. uh, personally as well as uh, on behalf of the Senior Lawyers Division and the State Bar. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I got a call.